The Olden World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 770 A Shady Deal Starlight and Maple stared at the delegation, Meltdown's armor steaming in the rain as Saffron bowed and Garshiva loomed over everything, slowly regaining her size after the rocket strike at Isvaldi. Maple's lip trembled and she couldn't speak, but for Starlight, stubbornness quickly won out over fear. What do you want? Meltdown locked eyes with her and pointed a metal-clad hoof at Starlight's nose. She looks identical to you, but has a different demeanor. She's on this ship. We have come for her. Why? Starlight asked. Behind Meltdown, Garshiva shifted, wings spread against the rain to add to her silhouette. She's an acquaintance who's chosen a convenient time to be out of touch. We made a bargain, and she hasn't been here to uphold her end of the deal. Starlight glanced at Maple. She's in our room. Go get her? Maple bit her lip, nodded, and scurried away. The visitors waited patiently, Saffron standing in the background, while Meltdown looked casually at the framework for the Harmony Comet, and Garshiva's eyes followed Starlight relentlessly. Starlight felt a faint pressure on her heart, fully remembering what she had been shown in Mistvale. Princess Luna had given Garshiva an artifice brand, and while she had never told her friends what she heard from them about the Nightmare of Scudimark later, it was a stare that would have frozen any normal pony, but Starlight was too used to getting knocked down for her own good. You keep looking at me like that, she said, staring back at Garshiva. Am I that interesting? Yes, Garshiva replied. You are. Now Meltdown and Saffron were both watching, and Starlight felt like she had somehow gotten into a staring contest with a goddess. Still, she wasn't about to back down, scrunching her cheeks and staring back. Garshiva kept it up for a minute, then chuckled. You'll want to visit my temple sometime when I'm not preoccupied with this. There's something there that you want, isn't there? Saffron frowned in concern. With all due respect, Your Majesty, you two know each other? Oh, we've had a talk. Garshiva flexed a claw against the deck, leaving no doubt in Starlight's mind that she was referring to Mistvale. Before anything more could be said, hooves sounded against stairs, and Glimmer appeared beside Starlight, clearing her throat. Hello. Garshiva's stone instantly darkened. Where have you been? Magical accident, Glimmer tapped her horn. You could say I got too big for my abilities. From what I've heard, it was the same event that brought you down to size, actually. She stared up at the Sphinx, not needing sight to find her. Apologies for not being on the network. I haven't been able to access it, and Aegis has been too busy guarding the princess to search for me. I thought it would be prudent to fix myself before meeting you in the state, but apparently you have other ideas. Things have not been well in your absence, Mildon warned. Accompany us to the temple at once. You have a contract to uphold. I'm that sorely needed? Glimmer frowned. My mission necessitates that most of my attention is needed here, especially now that my perception is hindered. Garshiva waved a paw. Don't know, don't care. I never gave you access to my resources so you could feign incompetence when I call a favor in return. This won't take long, Meltdown assured. Please, come with us. Glimmer glanced over at Starlight. I need to go. Take care of yourself. Remember what I said. Everything will be okay. Okay. Starlight nodded firmly, then squinted at Garshiva and Meltdown. I'll be fine. What do you need her for, anyway? Garshiva instantly wrapped a claw around Glimmer, holding her close and blasting away into the sky with a faint trail of red light. Meltdown nodded to the guards, and they turned to take flight as well, before giving Starlight a last look. Matters of state that shouldn't concern you. Farewell. Within seconds, the engines and Meltdown's back revved up, and she jumped into the air, trails of flame bursting out behind her and propelling her in a swift arc after Garshiva and the Griffins. Rain fell, and the deck was empty. 
Phew, Saffron whispered when they were gone. You don't just get house calls from a goddess every day. No, Starlet agreed, turning back toward the stairs to see Maple watching wordly from the bottom. It's late, and there's nothing to say about that. Saffron, bitter lip. I'm a little more hesitant to leave after that, but... Sure thing, sugar cube. See the lot of you tomorrow. Starlight? Maple approached her, joining her in the doorway as Saffron disappeared down the gangplank and into the night. What just happened? Starlight shook her head. Nothing. We got boarded by some ponies looking for someone, and they left without trouble. It wasn't Gazelle. It wasn't Lord Gyre. We're fine. Maple closed her eyes and nodded. And that's something to be thankful for. Would you like to go to bed? Get some sleep and see what the morning brings? Definitely, Starlet agreed, leaning against her side before getting up to return to the room. Newspaper clippings are a magnificent force of nature, Gazelle declared, surrounded by binders of carefully preserved pieces that had been yellowed by age, investigative tabloids, and other pieces all relating to the shenanigans of misbehaving royalty in their teenage years. I love newspaper clippings! When Lady's Empress, I'm going to ask her to make a holiday completely dedicated to newspaper clippings. If you're bored, you ask to see this, Gerbaldi that pants, pressing open another collection. Don't read them all. These are primary sources, not the long-term trends and observations compiled from them. Gazelle put on his sad kitten look. But I said I love them, he protested. I really do. Look at this. Did you know Princess Germaine was found ramming fishing boats in a demolition derby 300 years ago? I wish I had thought of that back in my pirate hunting days. Gerbaldi snorted and rolled his eyes. Yes, it starts silly. Turn the page a little later in a section. He flipped through half of Germaine's articles with a delicate wingtip. She used tying captives to bowsprits as an execution technique. Surprise! They were ramming vessels and turn earlier, and she's praised as a filly for her budding sea pony ship skills. In every single case, the trend is undeniable. Whatever they love manifests over and over as a backdrop to growing barbarism. Prince Grail cared deeply about reforesting Jara the Fool. That's where that led him. Gazelle bit his lip. Some sporting the unsporting crusade against anyone who dared use wood in construction? No, but you understand the picture. Gerbaldi closed Germain's book and set it aside. Sphinxes who love their provinces tend to be isolationist and crueler against others. Sphinxes who love mortal relations are known for being vindictive and having legendary scorn. Lovers of justice rule with iron paws. Gazelle's ears fell. Ones who would do anything to build a sister a perfect world will, in fact, do anything. History's most successful rulers have been the ones with vices that don't impact their leadership abilities, Gerobaldi continued, pulling out another volume. Lord Greatrock had a horrible personal life, but left Everlast in such a strong state it went on to grow into the powerhouse that is today. But this is all evidence of a foregone conclusion. Where things get interesting is when you graph the ages and levels of madness for each sphinx, plot that on a family tree, and plot that against time. He swiveled his chair to a different desk. Family and time period make a bigger difference than anything else. Is it upbringing? Genetics? Political climate in the world? Something else? That's where my research has been focused. Especially on sphinxes who have found and tried to fight this before. Gazelle was picking at his claws, half listening. So, what do you suppose Garshiva loves? And what is her advice for it? Gerbali frowned. Garshiva has ruled for thousands of years. If she was afflicted from this proclivity for madness as we are, she would have fallen to it already. That, or she's very good at hiding it. Gazelle waggled a talon. Think, Tomcat. This is interesting. Gerbaldi snorted. More likely, she has none, and engineered this flaw into our race to bring us down if anyone ever tried challenging her for godhood. 
No one knows how to make us things giant and immortal, but as long as there are ponies like Chauncey, someone is going to figure it out. Gazelle stuck his tongue out. Chauncey? Ugh. What are you looking into him for? Gerbaldi blinked. Well, when a known eugenics scientist has off-the-record dealings with the reigning emperor and empress, one has to be a little... Lin's parents? Gazelle's eyes lit dangerously, and he leaned closer. Tell me more. End of chapter 770